Hi, my name is Mateus Maia Pacheco and I am one of the authors of the monograph entitled The Development of Bimanual Coordination Across Toddlerhood, published in the monograph of the Society for Research and Child Development. So in this video, I will give a brief overview on three data analysis procedures that we use through the, the monograph. Before stating which analysis we will talk about, I would like to say that this presentation is directed to those who are starting on this analysis and want to have a broad idea what what these analysis do. So we are not we're assuming no mathematical background whatsoever. And but this is really just an introduction, okay? So for those who are interested in using the techniques. This video will be just a fast glance for understanding what each technique does and not much how it does. Uh, we will provide some references uh, uh, accompanying the video and for those who, inter who are interested, please uh, take a look. These texts are really nice and can be read by a really broad audience. So let's start with the Hilbert Transform Relative Phase. So, the main goal of the monograph was to explore the means through which toddlers would implement a new motor coordination pattern in bimanual drumming. Drumming is a continuous movement, and to describe how they perform this movement pattern, we need measures that can capture the movement continuously at each frame of their movement. Children were tasked with performing a movement pattern that is characterized by opposite motion of the limbs. Uh, this is a stick figure doing that, and but you can imagine what uh, what the what the kids are doing by looking at it. This is an opposite motion. So as the left hand goes down, the right hand goes up. If you plot this uh, each hand over time, you have these nice figures. You see here that as the right hand goes up, the left hand goes down, and the opposite is also true. So this was the goal of our, uh, of our task in the monograph. So to capture this pattern, we use the measure commonly considered in the literature, the relative phase. So let me explain what relative phase is. So consider someone performing the drumming continuously with one hand. If we capture the motion of the hand over time, we see an oscillatory pattern. So here we have time, okay? In the x-axis and position in the y-axis. If the person is doing like an oscillatory motion, you see these nice patterns going over time. So just to make sure we won't have any problems later, we usually take out the mean of the, the signal as you see here. So I decrease two of the signal now the data oscillates around zero. In the monograph, we explain the relative phase in terms of a sine wave. Here I will just show in a different way so everybody can understand what a phase is. So if we plot the oscillatory motion in terms of its velocity, we find a nice circle with the current state of the oscillation being represented by the current angle between position and velocity. So here, this is position, this is velocity, and if we see this going on over time, you see this angle here, this nice angle going on. This, we can call it the phase, because it represents the relation between the link position and its velocity. If you now consider both hands, as we did, this is the plot of the, of the like two slides ago, so left hand and right hand, we can represent the current coordination pattern between the two hands as the relative phase between hands. That is, we take the difference between the phase of hand 1 and the phase of hand 2. So it would be basically decreasing the signal, this phase, so this angle, from this angle uh, correctly, not, not the way I'm showing, but like really decreasing one angle from the other over time. The anti-phase pattern, the pattern that I showed the, the, the stick figure doing, is described as a relative phase of 180 degrees or pi radians. 
exactly the one that I'm showing here. The toddler that can maintain such oscillatory pattern over time is achieving our task goal. As you see in our monograph, the description of relative phase over time helped us to describe how toddlers achieve this goal. So one of the methods to describe the continuous, the continuous relative phase is exactly the one that we just described. This is usually called, surprisingly, continuous relative phase. Nevertheless, some authors pointed out some issues with this measure. One of them is the requirement of normalization of the data. So both position and velocity must be between minus one and one. This would alleviate frequency changes or and shifts, uh, that is, uh, means that changes over time. And this is not quite correct for, no, for real data. So if you normalize the data as, you, as I did here, you will meet this requirement. You see here that I was quite smart just showing to you guys something that goes from minus one to one in both axes. But this is not true for all data and uh, you will see some examples of when non-normalizing creates an issue. Lemon Stockel shows uh, show a nice illustration of when normalization solves the issue and when normalization doesn't. So in this case here, we have two signals, both uh, sinusoidal signals, and one is just this is just the first shifted by 18 degrees. So uh, if if we want a method that describes their relation over time, we just should have a result of 18 degrees between them, a relative phase of 18 degrees. So if you plot the original data over time, you will see something like this, which will provide a weird relative phase, a relative phase that actually oscillates over time. So this is what we mean by you need to normalize it, because as soon as you normalize the data, the relative phase is constant as it should be. Now, there are cases where normalization does not help you. Actually, sometimes it might even introduce some artifacts. In this case here, we have two non-sinusoidal signals and they have, they have a shift between them which creates some, some different phases. As you see here, if you norm, not normalize the data, the continuous black, uh, the black line here, the continuous black line, you see that you have some, not a true relative phase. The true relative phase is this one uh, with, the, with the diamonds on the line. But if you normalize it, you, you, there are different methods of doing this. If you normalize it, the first method gives you something even worse than the non-normalized data or something that creates large and large deviations, which, which is not correct. So in these cases, uh, the best way to solve it is to use the Hilbert transform. This transformation, in simple terms, expands the signal to the complex domain. As this requires some technical knowledge, I will try to show what it does to a signal and how this provides a phase, rather than trying to provide a full explanation of the mathematical procedure per se. So let us say that we have a signal oscillating between 1 and minus 1 like this one. So imagine this is the hand moving up and down. So if we consider this should be a real part of a complex number, I want to find its imaginary part because this, what I have currently, is the real part. So I want to, using this method of a Hilbert transform, what I want to find is the phase quadrature of the signal. This is obtained by shifting the signal by 90 degrees in the complex plane. It really sounds terrible or really hard to do, but what we mean is something like this. Remember, uh, we showed before what was a, a 180 degrees relation between two oscillatory signals. This would be matching, so the peak of one, of one signal will be matching the valley of the other. But you see that this is kind of in between, so this 
imaginary part is the same signal shifted by 90 degrees. So this is the phase quadrature. If we now plot this in the same way we did before, but not in terms of position and velocity, but in terms of real and imaginary parts, we see that we can also get a phase between uh, imaginary and real, so we can get this angle here. And then we have the phase of the signal. And then if we want the relative phase between two signals, we just do the same procedure we did for one hand. So we do the Hilbert transform on one hand, the Hilbert transform on the second hand, get the phases of each one of them, and subtract one from the other. Employing this Hilbert transform is a methodological advance as it does not suffer from the same criticisms of the continuous relative phase. For those who are interested, uh, I will put uh, some references uh, in the who will campaign, campaign, who actually will follow the video. Let's now go to the second type of analysis that we do, the wavelet analysis. So two other important features that uh, of Toddler's motor behavior. Is, is to understand the motion of their hands, right? So we know the relative phase, the hands, which is related to the goal. And now we want to know how each link moved in order to achieve the goal. Two characteristics that are really important for us are the amplitude of the signal, that is basically how large the oscillation is, and the frequency of the signal, uh, that is basically the time it takes for the signal to complete a full cycle. Readers or listeners who are accustomed to the techniques of signal processing will likely recognize that the usual procedure is to perform a spectral analysis, typically relying on the Fourier transform and other related techniques. An example is this signal that, when analyzed through spectral analysis, show two main frequencies composing the signal. So here are all frequencies possible. And this is a measure of how much each frequency contributes to the signal. Here you see a one hertz frequency being this fast oscillation. So one cycle per second with high power and a slower frequency with a, a smaller contribution there is this slow wave going on here that is the other component. You notice that when we analyze the data this way, what we have is something, uh, what we have is a single decomposition, meaning that we have, uh, we need a signal that maintains its amplitude and frequency over time, or we can say a stationary signal. But this is not the case when a toddler, for instance, is learning to drum. You observe changes in frequency as time passes, or even changes in amplitude. So this is an exemplary trial where the toddler was uh, oscillating one hand, it stopped, and it os come back, came back, and os started oscillating again. So this was really slow frequency, the really slow motion to reach the peak again. And so what we need is a method that can specify for us that, well, the frequency around here was faster than the frequency around here, and sometimes, well, the amplitude here was smaller than the amplitude here. We need something like this to understand how toddlers achieved our goal. And this is exactly what the wavelength analysis does. So, to avoid again some technicalities, the wavelet analysis transforms the original data set by observing how a prototype function matches the original data set. So, this is the original data set that we had before, and uh, we need a prototype function. Prototype functions can have a number of formats, all of them are types of oscillatory patterns. The one that we use in the monograph is the Morlet, uh, there is this nice one. So, to do the wavelength analysis, we need to modify this, modify but in terms of time and space, 
to see how it fits to this data. In doing that, we understand what is the time, the specific time of an oscillation, the specific uh, amplitude of it. So, for instance, we do this transformation and see, okay, yeah, uh, we needed to change this signal by in terms of time this way, in terms of amplitude this much, and then we understand what over time what types of oscillation we had. For those more interested in the actual mathematical procedure, the transform is the convolution of the time series with the prototype function scaled and translated in time. Uh, for those interested, uh, you need to read the Torrance and Compo 19, uh, 1998 uh, paper that we will put in the references. So let us go to the MATLAB to see how we can do that, because it looks really hard to do. But luckily for us, MATLAB and other so uh, software packages have this whole procedure organized into a single code. Let me go here. Mm, sorry. So this is the 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 MATLAB. Uh, for those who are not used to MATLAB, this is the leave. Uh, the live editor, the live editor. This, this, uh, this is a new implementation. But for those who are, who have the the, the older or older, older versions, this it's okay. This, the code is the same. Everything is the same. So okay. In this signal, I. So here, what I did was basically, I created a time vector. Uh, that has two seconds uh, with a 1000 Hertz signal uh, that we can see. And we now we want to create some uh, sinusoidal signals so then we can. Let me just expand this part for us for you guys to see the whole code. So we want to create oscillatory signals for then you, uh, for then we to see how the wavelet analysis can show, can demonstrate changes in frequency and amplitude over time. So to refresh the signal here, uh, a sinusoidal signal can be described by this, in this structure. So we have the, the time series, that is x. So it's a times a sine wave with two pi times time, this time times frequency, where A is the amplitude and FR is the frequency in Hertz. So here I'm creating a signal A that is basically, uh, we are not multiplying by anything, so the, the amplitude is 1, uh, and the frequency inside is 2 pi times time, times frequency A, that it, ha it, ha it is uh, 15 Hertz. Okay, and we did the same, so signal B has the same structure, so the same amplitude, but frequency B then is 1.5. So this signal has an oscillation with lower frequency than this one, than signal A. And signal C, uh, we, we compose it with two different frequencies. Frequency C that is 3, frequency A that is one, uh, with 15 Hertz. And this first part of the signal the, with the 15 Hertz has 0 0.5 amplitude. So, and then we put one in front of the other, like this figure is showing here. So we have the first signal A with a really fast frequency, uh, 15 Hertz. Then uh, the 1.5 Hertz oscillation. And then the mix of a 15 Hertz and a 3 Hertz oscillatory pattern. So we want a, an analysis that can show us that well, this signal has uh, one amplitude, one as amplitude and 15 hertz, one as amplitude 15 and 1.5 hertz, and two signals, one with 0 0.5 amplitude, as we did here, and another one with one and two different frequencies. Okay? So the code in my lab is CWT, and CWT is continuous wavelet transform. So, okay, we've got the signal put in here uh, with one, as we said, 100 hertz, 1000 hertz. Uh, the, of data in here and there you go you have 
the plot that comes out. This is the frequency of oscillation, this is the time of the time series, and this is the magnitude, uh, the same as the power as we saw before. So for the two first seconds, here we expect something with amplitude 1 and 15 Hertz. And this is what we see. See, we only have one signal with one of magnitude, the color represents one, and 15 Hertz. As long as we have like the break in this signal, the wavelength analysis also show the break and shows me that we have a lower frequency now, 1.5, also with an amplitude of 1. Again, when you reach 4 seconds, we have now two peaks here. One peak that is 15 Hertz, but you see that this, this color is different because it represents only 0.5 amplitude and the other one with 3 Hertz, one, one as an amplitude you have it here. So this is what we did. So then knowing which peaks we have, we can get then what is the main frequency of oscillations and its amplitude over time. That's what we did in the in our in our in our monograph. So one important point is this cone of influence, this shaded area here. So this represents the part of the analysis that could be corrupted by a procedure that wavelength usually does that is called padding. The wavelength analysis assumes that the data is cyclic, cyclic. But what we have here is, well, as everybody has, is a finite length time series. It's over after some time. Then the procedure will add zeros at the beginning and end of the time series to measure uh, the frequency of these times, these time points. This is even more important for slow frequencies that require longer time series windows to be measured. So this padding technique introduces some discontinuities and this might alter the result of the wavelength. This shaded area just says you should be careful considering this area. Uh, it's not saying that it's wrong. I should remember you guys, like, so this is not saying that all this is for sure wrong, but you guys should be careful. Okay, now we are ready to go to the third analysis that we want to explain in this slide, is the linear mixed effect analysis, this is the inferential analysis. Uh, the previous two analyses were more about uh, getting some some uh, describing the data and here now we want to say okay the, the individuals change by this much uh, over this amount of time because of this group of this manipulation something like this so what we want to do is to describe the general trends we have in the data but we cannot forget that there is substantial variability between individuals okay in the past uh, Early researchers usually try to fit individual regressions for each individual using the common ordinary least square errors. So imagine that we have like a dependent variable here that goes from minus 5 to 20 and an independent variable here. What early researchers would do, would, they would get like, so these are different individuals, they will fit these linear regressions to each, to each of these uh, lines. So it's these uh, data points, right? This time series. Uh, and then they would get, okay, a, a sl a, uh, an intercept and uh, a slope for each, each individual. So if uh, subject one is the blue one, okay, we have an intercept around zero and a slope of, uh, I don't know, some number. And then you will do that for each individual, and then you will use these A's and B's, the intercepts and slopes, to see the effect of the experimental manipulations and groups and so on. Nevertheless, some pro these procedures have some issues. One is that the uh, ordinarily square errors requires the resultant errors of the model, that is the noise that is around the data, to be independent, normally distributed, and have constant variance. 
Well, this is not true for the kind of modeling we want to perform. The variability within each individual, in our case, is not independent and varies depending on the individual and month of the measurement. Thus, we need some other technique. So that's what we do uh, when we use the linear mix effect. Uh, we can call it LME or we can call it many ways. So this has several names in the literature. Uh, one is the hierarchical linear models. The other one is linear mix effect, or the multi-level modeling, and so on. The idea of this type of analysis is to understand different nested levels of data without violating assumptions of independence of error. This analysis uses the maximum likelihood procedure, which avoids the problem of the ordinary least square errors. The data presented in the monograph had a nested st structure. What we mean by it is that we have individuals changing over time. We have like measurements for each individual in time, and we have you can say oh we have like sex, we have genders, we have uh, groups. And so this is kind of a nested data. So we have data within individual and we want to see effects also between individuals. And this is kind of a nested type of data. So to capture the within and between person variability, we model data using different levels. The first level will be change within individual. That is, we will model performance as a function of time or practice experience in our task. Formally, we say that the, the individual starts with some performance, the intercept, like this, alpha, here, and change in a given rate as he, she practice over time. So this alpha 2i times time, t here. Uh, and we always have some non-explained error here, this variability. And this, uh, as you see that like we have these i and j, so for each one of them, this i represents each individual, and j might be, for instance, each month of the measurement. Uh, so we are assuming clearly, so we, if we model all individuals this way, we are assuming that they have algebraically the same way, so they change differently, but having always like, their change in terms of intercept and slope, for instance, also always like a linear change in this case. Uh, but now we want to know how they vary between them, and, and this is modeled in terms of the intercept and slope. So we create a second level where the intercept and slope are the resultant variables. In the second level, the intercept, for instance, this one, has a general mean and is a general mean, this beta 1 1, and is a function of a between level variable, let's say in this case it could be sex. And all these with an added error, so like some another variation that occurs at this level of analysis now. So, and then we do the same for the slope. So the slope has a mean and has some effect of this between individuals variable. You see that sex, well, that's not a good example currently, but like this is, sex is, uh, in this time scale of this experiment, does not change over time, so this represents a between individual variable. Uh, the variability between individuals in terms of intercept and slope are important to understand change. So let's think, well, if we have variability in terms of intercept, but all individuals change equally in terms of slope, we have these, these difference in terms of intercept, but a good, a really consistent between individuals change in terms of slope. And this represents, might represent some interesting process in terms of, it, of development. Also, we might have the case where the intercept does not vary, so all of them start similarly, but they change differently over time. Finally, you can have the case where both vary between individuals and we, with this kind of analysis we can even measure when the variation in terms of intercept and slope could vary. So it might be that we can answer the question, are those the ones who are good at first, the ones who never change anymore, they reach like a ceiling level 
or no, the ones who start better are the ones who change more, improve more. So then we can answer those kind of questions. The LME also has an implementation code in many software packages. In my lab, you can use the feed LME or feed GLME. The first deals with linear uh, models and the second deals with some transformations, the data that make them linear. So for instance, we can play with sigmoidal curves, uh, such as the one that we use in the monograph, because these are good for bin binomial distribution and can be transformed in linear models. As you see in our monograph, we vary the usage of fit LME and fit GLME depending on the data requirements. And for more information about the methods and analysis, please read our monograph. Thank you.